Hi there. In week six of this course, we discussed the future research agenda in terrorism studies. And one of the topics that we have highlighted is the Western bias in terrorism studies. So the field of terrorism studies is dominated by Western-based institutes and scholars, and this has also resulted in a Western-focused research agenda. But when looking at the global map of attacks, we see that most attacks take place elsewhere, in the Middle East, South Asia, Western and Eastern Africa, for instance. Well, we're very glad to have someone with us today who is an expert on terrorism in Africa, Dr. Akinola Olojo, who is a senior researcher at the Institute for Security Studies based in Dakar in Senegal. Well, he has worked at various institutes across the globe, ranging from South Africa, Kenya, Nigeria, but also the US, the UK, France, and also for a while here with us in The Hague in the Netherlands. So he has firsthand experience at a wide variety of different research institutes. Dr. Olojo is also frequently giving lectures and workshops for international organizations, and he's often analyzing trends in the media. So welcome. We're very glad to have you with us today. Thank you for having me. So I would first of all like to start by asking you if you actually agree with our statement that terrorism studies is in fact dealing with a Western bias. Maybe for instance, if we look at the topics that we study. Now, this is a real subject. Thanks for the question. Um, I will say yes, to a certain degree, there is um, some bias, but then I'd like to um, respond uh, in a way that sort of expands the scope of what we're looking at. I'll also try to be as specific as possible. Um, on one level, when we look at, for instance, um, the media's portrayal, and I'm speaking specifically in terms of uh, the media uh, agencies in the West, for example, or in, in, in Europe or the United States, when we look at the portrayal of the media of certain violent extremist attacks or incidents in some African countries, compared to those attacks that occur in the West, uh, we see a certain, you know, what appears to be sort of different standards being applied in terms of how these events are covered. So a very you know, quick example that comes to mind um, takes us back to January, 2019. Um, some of us might recall that in Nairobi, Kenya at the time, there was a major attack at a complex known as Dusit D2. And following the, you know, the incident that occurred there, um, we had this major coverage by a Western media agency, um, sort of showing uh, the bodies in a very graphic way of victims of this attack. And something which shocked a lot of people who watched this and who saw uh, you know, these images sort of you know, so glaringly in, in the print. And it sort of raised the question of you know, issues regarding you know, the sensitivity towards the humanity, um, sensitivity towards you know, the pain of families, uh, sensitivity in terms of, uh, of how we view these individuals and the trauma which they've gone through, uh, you know, the families of those affected. You know, because you don't quite see that same kind of coverage, uh, you know, the graphic coverage in, in other countries in the West. So I think this was something which really highlighted all these issues I just mentioned, and one which is a continuing debate. So that's on the one hand. Now, on another level, um, when we speak in a conceptual way, in terms of, you know, conceptual framings, um, we, we give a, an example earlier about, you know, this idea of uh, terms such as foreign fighters. And I'd like to elaborate this a bit more. Um, most African countries have a complex colonial history, which has shaped the borders that sort of uh, define their presence on the continent. And when we look at the idea of foreign fighters, for example, you know, something which we tend to understand as you know, individuals who cross the border of a state to another state to join a group against you know, certain parties and so on. When we try to transfer that concept or apply it to the African context, then we see that it doesn't quite match the reality because what we see in Africa, we have countries which actually have borders, but the individuals or communities on either side of those borders share a common history. There is a common language, there is a common ethnicity, you know, there's a common trajectory that they come from, even traditionally. And that raises questions regarding the need for us to revisit some of these key questions and concepts that we apply in studies on terrorism or violent extremism. And it also has meaning or implications for the kind of policies that we formulate 
or how we respond or intervene in some of these situations. So I think this is very key when we speak about bias. It's something which is really, uh, we, you know, which really should not be overlooked. Yeah, thanks so much. I think it's very interesting that you mentioned well, both eh, media coverage and how that might have some bias and how we uh, portray or report differently about events in different parts of the world, but also like how our findings can be uh, well biased or not really attuned to the context in uh, which something takes place. So also our findings can be affected. But maybe also more broadly, do you think that in terms of the, the topics that we study as a like global community of terrorism scholars, right? So we, we, we focus on certain topics and less so on others. Do you think also in, in terms of the, the selection of uh, what we find important, where we ask funding uh, for research, do you think that's also uh, dealing with some kind of Western bias? Or, or maybe you don't really see it in terms of the topics. That could also be the case. Do you see it in terms of like what is on the research agenda? But I think also this is um, one which is, you know, needs to be informed by the contextual um, environment where these countries are, are situated. Um, to some extent, there might be some bias, but I think largely we're dealing with a common threat. It's always good to sort of frame it that way. We're dealing with a common enemy. Um, whether we're looking at Europe, or we're looking at the United States or even African countries, um, the problem of violent extremism, and I think even the groups that are implicated whether we're looking at Al-Qaeda or ISIS, we see the affiliates across you know, continents or countries globally. But then I think when we look at the specific themes um, that need to be sort of examined, we need to also look at the nuances that exist in those countries. So for example, what does resilience mean uh, you know, in terms of uh, you know, the African context? Um, what does um, you know, the economies of violence mean? when we look at the actors or the type of actors involved, either states or non-states, you know, and they also have differentiated expressions. What does transitional justice mean? I mean, we might have a common understanding of this, but then when we want to apply these themes to uh, the African context, we may want to take into account traditional forms or institutions that have a stake in some of these um, issues. We may want to take into account um, the history of the people in some of these communities, you know, so these things are shaped by those institutions or those communities and their histories in the African context, as it should also be in other continents. So I think these themes are very key. Um, maybe one more thing to mention, perhaps, um, when we think about the idea of dialogue, for instance, this was a theme which, I mean, it's a recurrent theme, but then at the Institute for Security Studies, we, we sort of explored it, you know, in a very, you know, deliberate way about two or three years ago. And what we did was we tried to raise the question of to what extent can dialogue uh, be applied or negotiation with some of these groups be applied, you know, so I think contextually, again, when we look at the African context and the countries within the continent, we need to understand exactly the conditions that can help shape such a dialogue framework if it's something that can be explored. And then, of course, the idea of the military approach. There are contexts in Europe where, um, you know, maybe the use of force may have worked. Uh, maybe in the case of Syria and Iraq, for example, um, pushing ISIS away from those countries might have worked militarily. But in the case of Africa, it may not work because we need to look at how these groups and their affiliates are embedded within communities. And some of those supply chains and those conditions, those risk factors of governance are sort of tied into those conditions and how we can sort of have an approach that is mixed and maybe sort of, um, uh, sort of nuanced, you know, again, in terms of how we respond. So context matters. And I think the African situation or the African uh, space really highlights this in a very bold way. Yeah, thank you. That's very insightful. Again, like the, the importance of the local context. Um, maybe to end with a very short question, like, uh, do you think over the past years, um, there has been increasing awareness indeed of uh, the need to, to look more at these contextual factors? Do you feel the field is improving in that sense that maybe a few years ago, there was a tendency to apply these broader models to, to any type of case? Do you think you've been around in the field for quite some years? Is the situation improving that terrorism scholars as such indeed try to be more aware of these local factors, the things you just mentioned? Do you see any progress, basically? No, it's a good question. I think um, over the years, I think something which um, longevity gives us, um, I could speak for myself, for instance, what it gives is perspective. 
So for someone like me, for example, I, I mean, I, I've tried my best to follow the trends and also not just study, but write on these trends um, dating back to 2003. So it's been almost 20 years. And I think it gives you perspective and also a sense of humility, because the more you know, the more you realize that there's so much that you do not know. So there's always that constant need to learn lessons across contexts. Now, I think we've seen improvements in terms of our knowledge. Um, we've seen improvements in terms of African um, individuals from Africa engaging in all these, you know, you know, this process of knowledge production, but also trying to engage in spaces where policy uh, discussions take place. So for example, I work with the Institute for Security Studies. We have offices across the continent in Dakar, in Addis Ababa, in South Africa, Pretoria, in Nairobi. And something we try to do is that not only do we try to engage in, uh, you know, grounding our work in evidence-based, in an evidence-based framework, but we do it in a timely way because we're dealing with a rapidly shifting landscape. And we try to take the work we do to the global space. So when we have, for example, the UN um, General Assembly side events, for example, you know, we try to be in those spaces where we can engage with actors or entities across uh, you know, other, other regions or continents and to see how we can also learn from each other. I think perhaps something which can help is to continue this process of dialogue. So engaging in a continued, you know, continued conversation around these issues. Not only that, but also perhaps even having more funding because you need funds to be able to sort of um, uh, engage in research, to go to communities, to engage them, to um, get data, you know, that is timely, you know, and to also see how those, uh, you know, this data is sort of framed in a way that policy can, can, can make use of this. So I think funding is also very key. And, and I'm not ashamed to mention that indeed, uh, this is something which is indeed a need for us. Um, maybe finally, perhaps, is to also highlight the fact that um, I think there is a lot of um, optimism in spite of the, the narratives of violence on the continent. Uh, we see young people being more and more interested in this field, not only men, but also across gender lines. We see women um, you know, having a lot of interest. I've, I've worked with quite a number of them at the ISS and also outside the ISS from Africa, and maybe perhaps to just conclude with what we call the theory of change that we have. And it's the idea that if um, the public and decision makers are informed and supported by an institution that is not only credible, but also independent, like ISS, um, we believe that the African continent and, and you know, the global stage as a whole will be in a position to shape and influence um, appropriate human security policies and practices. And if we get to the point where we can translate this theory into reality, then I think we would have done um, quite, quite a lot in terms of our efforts. Thank you. Thank you. It's great to also end on such a positive note. Uh, well, thanks for sharing your insights with us in this very short interview. Of course, there's a lot more to discuss. So uh, for those of you at home, uh, if you want to know more about Dr. Ologia's research on terrorism in Africa, uh, we recommend you to watch the other interview that we have conducted um, with him as part of the MOOC. And you can also find a number of links to the publications by today's experts. So thanks again, Dr. Akinola Alojo, for joining us today. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure.